Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm Abraham Cray from the Everglades Research and Education Center in Bell Lake. Uh, so today I want to talk a little bit about nitrogen management, management of sugarcane on Florida sands. So we, we grow about, uh, there's about 400,000 acres of sugarcane uh, grown in South Florida for sugar. There's, there's in other parts of the state, in North Florida, for example, there's a little bit of sugarcane grown for syrup, but there are about four counties in South Florida, uh, the, most of that 400,000 acres is grown. And a little background, uh, sugarcane is grown on about 115,000 of that 400,000 acres on mineral soils. The rest is grown in the Everglades Ag area, uh, mostly in Palm Beach County. Uh, this, so this is a predominantly in areas adjacent to the Everglades Ag area where the, that we have the mineral soils. These soils are split soils, and soils, and alpha soils typically. They are sands with very low organic matter uh, from 1% to 2.5% typically. Uh, low nutrient and water holding capacities. Uh, and fertilizer in is the primary end source. So uh, just a map of where this where we're talking about here. Uh, the most of this is on the, the four counties there in South Florida. Uh, Palm Beach County the, is mostly or the or the organic soils are. Uh, the the other three counties, Henry, Glades, and Martin counties, are, are adjacent areas that are that uh, Glades and Henry do have some organic soils, but most of these other three counties would be where the mineral soils that that we're talking about. So uh, just let's talk a little bit about the nitrogen cycle then, because there's important transformations here that are going to affect the use of nitrogen. So the blue boxes there are potential sources of nitrogen for the crop. Uh, you might get a little bit of from atmospheric fixation from lightning, not much. Um, uh, you, you might apply some animal nearers and biosolids, not much of that would be used on these soils for sugarcane. Uh, you might have some plant residues from a previous crop or a cover crop that was grown between planting some sugar cane. You might get a little bit from that. From that. Uh, biological fixation from legumes. The only input that, that you might have with sugar cane is if you had a leguminous cover crop that was grown, cow peas, uh, sun hemp or something that you might get a little input from that for the first crop. Uh, but most of the input of for these for these soils for sugarcane is going to be commercial fertilizers. So then the, the green boxes there are then the different forms that the, the nitrogen can be in it's atmospheric nitrogen, uh, organic nitrogen, ammonium and nitrate in the soil. Then the the red boxes are things we're concerned about the, the potential losses. We'd like to have as much possible that's removed in the crop harvest. Uh, you you might have loss utilization. Uh, loss, loss into the atmosphere. You can have some runoff and erosion. You can have denitrification that would be losses uh, uh, that would occur under very wet conditions, low aeration. And you can have leaching, especially with, with nitrate form that's, that's lost into the groundwater or surface water. So we'll talk a little bit more about these in detail. So uh, for uh, potential nitrogen transformation, potential losses, First mineralization, this is the conversion of organic into ammonium. Uh, so this, this would be an actual high contribution of nitrogen on the organic soil. So for the organic soils and the EAA, we don't recommend nitrogen for sugarcane because you, you're getting, you know, with these soils that are typically 70, 80% organic matter, you're getting maybe six to 800 pounds of the end per acre per year that are mineralized. So over that crop, uh, for that crop in that situation, they, the growers would need to apply nitrogen. But for these mineral soils that are one to two two percent organic matter, the mineralization would be a small contribution, not zero, but it would be a small contribution. So uh, and immobilization is one that microorganisms use nitrogen from the soil as energy to break down materials that are high in carbon, as with plant residues. So if you're adding, you're adding something to the soil, if you're adding compost, or if you're if you're uh, growing a cover crop that would be high in carbon before you replant sugarcane, 
potentially we could have nitrogen tied up as part of that uh, the, that breakdown process so that you need to consider that if you're planting sugarcane into something like that you might need to add some extra nitrogen to get through that until that that material is broken down the nitrogen will be released at that point so immobilization is something to keep in mind if you're applying high cn ratio material so uh uh, others then volatilization then is a potential loss uh, uh, as, a, as a gas from ammonium or urea. Uh, it's more of a problem under high pH conditions, especially with uncoated urea. So Dr. Franzen just talked about some of this, uh, especially if you're applying urea to the soil surface and especially with high pH situations. Uh, nitrification is the microbial conversion of ammonium to nit nitrite and then nitrate. It happens quickly in aerated soils with warm temperatures. So this, this happens very quickly in Florida. If you apply an ammonium material, it's going to be quickly converted to nitrate and then be subject to leaching losses. Then the nitrate it is negatively charged, so it's not going to be held even, even in our in our soils with uh, especially in our soils in Florida. Denitrification, this is uh, under very wet conditions, low aeration. Uh, when you have water lock conditions, nitrogen can be lost as, as anaerobic microbes obtain oxygen from the nitrate or nitrite. So then you have nitrogen gas or nitrogen oxide gas lost to the atmosphere. So how do we reduce volatilization losses? So uh, one way is if you apply urea, uh, this point, and, and historically, uh, at least uh, other than possibly for or applying you know, the urea in, as part of the, the furrow application where it's going to be covered when you plant the sugarcane, I don't think uh, urea has been a, a huge source uh, for sugarcane on these soils, but if you do apply urea or other ammonium sources, then, then if you can incorporate that material, uh, that would be a, a possible way to reduce the losses. You might consider other sources other than straight urea. <clears throat> uh, a previous speaker talked about urease inhibitors, and that can be that can be beneficial to the delay losses for that seven to 14 day period when maybe you can get enough rain to move the material into the soil. Coated urea has become more popular in recent years uh, as a control release source, which could also prevent volatilization. It is a more expensive source than uncoated urea, but it has become an important uh, part of the fertilizer program on, on a lot of these soils. Uh, then reducing losses through leaching and denitrification. So with denitrification, it's important to use good, good drainage practices to be able to, to move the water off the land as quickly as you can. Uh, a good ditch cleaning program, canal cleaning program is important to make sure that, that the system that you have can remove the water as quickly as possible. You're still going to, in South Florida, you're still going to have situations where it's going to be, it's going to be really wet. So you, it's going to be a part of, of what's happening. But if you can keep Keep it down to a minimum, that's important. Um, it's important to avoid large applications of soluble nitrogen, including ammonium and nitrate sources. Uh, so that's why we say not to apply more than 50 pounds of soluble in at a time. Split the applications of nitrogen through the growing season to supply the end when it's needed by the crop. And again, control release sources are an option. <clears throat> so, for sure, cane on Florida sands, the primary in source is commercial fertilizer. Soluble sources include ammonium nitrate, ammonium sulfate, and urea. So urea and ammonium sources are acid forming in terms of this, the effect on the soil pH, so that's important to consider. The uncoated urea can result in high losses of in through volatilization when left on the soil surface. And then control release sources use a polymer coating to allow for release over a plan time period. Uh, a few years ago, uh, we conducted a, a study of nitrogen rates with sugarcane on sands. This is one of those 
one of those locations in Martin County. So uh, that's in that study, we were trying to, to update the, the nitrogen recommendations for sure you know, on sands. Uh, the previous recommendation was 180 pounds for all, all, all plant and retoon crops. And this curve, we developed a response curve here, and we determined for, for plant cane crops that, uh, the, that the recommendation should be increased to 220 pounds of N per acre per year. And we did uh, retoon crops separately and determined that that uh, those could be uh, the recommendations should, should be increased to 200 pounds per acre. The retoon crop is a little bit shorter time period, uh, so a little bit a little bit lower recommendation there for those. So these are the recommendations that came out with these. I believe it was 2016. Uh, the the and again, the end rates 220 and 200 for plant and retune. And if, if it's an all soluble program, we would recommend that these be five splits for plant cane and four for retune. And, and that the, the soluble in application should be no more than 50 pounds of soluble in per application. So that's, that's an important part of the BMP and that if you're applying a lot more in that, then you can lose a lot at one time with, with a heavy rain. There is a rainfall exception that you can apply an additional 30 pounds of in for the total total year. Uh, this is when a, uh, a specific location has more than four inches of rain in a two day period and within 20 days after a soluble in application. So control release sources are an option for an, uh, to an all soluble in program. And this is, this has become an important part of, of a lot of programs in, in, uh, on these mineral soils and it's been adopted more in recent years. The, the control release fertilizer is more expensive, but it has become, uh, it has came down in cost so that it is an option. You, you, it allows you to uh, reduce the number of applications. Uh, these have a polymer coating depending on temperature for release of nutrients. Uh, nutrient release will depend on the type and thickness of the coating. Uh, by combining soluble nutrients with coated materials at different release times, they can formulate a, a fertilizer to, to meet the crop demand. Typically, for sugarcane only soils, they would be making still make, making at least two applications. There's so much uh, fertilizer that's needed for the year, it's hard to go for the whole year uh, for, for that. But two or three applications, in some case, rather than four or five. Uh, fertilizer is more expensive, but you can eliminate some application costs. It has the advantage of supplying the nutrients the crop needs them and, and having less nitrate in, in the soluble form in case of high rainfall. And when using a control release uh, material, I, I, I recommend that that's the growers work with their suppliers to make sure that, that the, those release times are what is being marketed as because that's that's an important part of this. If it doesn't release following the expected release time, that's a, that's a real problem, and you're not gaining anything. So, in summary, the mineral soils and sugarcane production are sands with low nutrient holding capacity. Fertilizer ends the primary end source. Uh, ammonium is quickly converted to nitrate through not denitrification, and so nitrates is is easily leached. Uh, try not to apply more than 50 pounds of soluble in in one application. This means four to five splits a year for 200, 220 pounds of in per acre. And control release is an option uh, with a polymer coating, allowing you to, to reduce the number of applications. Thanks.